Hello, wonderful people. Welcome to Passion Projects. My name is Julie, and I am the creator and organizer of Passion Projects here at GitHub. It's Christmas, be generous. It's a super special edition of Passion Projects. Um, if you have not heard her name before, it is Melissa Severini, and she was GitHub's first employee, as well as GitHub's first female employee, and she led business development and operations for her, four, her first four years. She recently left us um, to go on an extended vacation, which she more than deserves. Um, but now she's going to come up and uh, give the best talk ever. We also have Mara Ruby here, who will be performing after Melissa's talk. So stick around for that. We'll also have Eggnog Alley. That sounds dangerous because it is dangerous. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Melissa Severini. Hi. Hello. 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 Hi. Um, thanks. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Julie. Um, Eggnog Alley does sound dangerous. Should we just skip right to that? No. Uh, so, full disclosure, Julie said that I could just stand up here and stare into the crowd for 20 minutes. What we're going to do is hopefully a little more exciting than that, but bear that in mind. Uh, that's the last resort. Um, uh, there are a lot of you here. <laughs> I see a lot of GitHubers here, which is a little bit of a mystery to me. I feel like you probably can expect me to say the same set of things that I've been saying for the last five years. <laughs> Put your dishes in the sink. <laughs> no, we can't have a company Tesla. There's a reason we're doing it this way. Uh, no, no one's leaving. OK, all right. Uh, thanks again to Julie for all of her hard work in organizing passion projects. She has some awesome people on the ground with her. Um, GitHub's uh, office manager, facilities person, event planner, uh, the president, who probably showed you in and gave you your badge. Uh, and our soon-to-be famous streaming eagles. The guy is bringing this to you live everywhere, wherever you are. Um, I'm really about this, excited about the series, and I'm really excited about being included. Thanks, Julie. She's already run away. She's already in Eggnog Alley. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Melissa Severini. Uh, many of the things that Julie said were true. Um, I was GitHub's first employee, luckiest monkey on the internet. With the exception of AIM, somebody still has it on AIM. That's not me. That's not me you're talking to. <laughs> if you can figure out how to get it back from that person, I will reward you handsomely. Uh, I've spent most of my life in California, with the exception of eight years in Portland, Oregon. Um, sorry, GitHub's first non-technical employee. I like going off script. Rounding up on five years ago. Um, at that time, that brought the grand total of GitHub employees to five. Uh, we added a six before the year was out, a few more the following year, and now we're up over 230. Uh, I was also GitHub's first and only female employee for the first two years that I worked here. We eventually hired a wonderful gal named Beth uh, to do the shipping of our t-shirts and mugs and stuff, and it was really nice to finally have another woman around. Uh, it was another year, at least, before we hired a woman into a technical role. But, awesomely, we now have over 10 technical women at the company and close to 50 total. Uh, right? Day to day, <laughs> the last time, so we hit uh, about 20% women, uh, I think around summertime this year. And the last time that had been the case was when there were five of us and I was one of them. <laughs> so that was really exciting. It was a good summer. I think we're down a little under that right now, but, but we're catching up. Uh, day to day, I did something we referred to as business operations, uh, which encompassed everything from HR to office management and onboarding and mediation and procurement and booking travel and supporting the founders and planning drink ups, you name it. Uh, in the early days of the company, if it wasn't creating GitHub the product or providing support for that product, uh, it usually fell to me to do. Uh, I got to spearhead a lot of our firsts and one-offs as a company, which was cool. I found our first office space on 2nd and Howard. I uh, actually found this one also. Um, you should have seen it before, before Scott made it beautiful. Um, uh, I organized our first conference, CodeConf, in 2011. I purchased the OctaCat from the original artist, Simon Oxley. Um, as of about a month ago, as Julie mentioned, 
I am no longer with the company. Uh, although I do manage to show up to free lunch day with alarming regularity. <laughs> That's not a slide. Um, hmm. Oh. <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people ask me how I found GitHub. Uh, they say it in this tone that sort of suggests that I had this like prescient awareness of how big the company would become and how successful would be, we would be and how fast we would grow. Um, far be it from me to try to convince anyone otherwise. <laughs> um, but the way it really went down uh, was this. A uh, dear friend of mine, Andy Delcom, who could not be here tonight, uh, knew about Git and GitHub uh, and was a very early fan of the company and he knew that the company was small but growing. One day he suggested I reach out to these guys who may be in need of the kind of help that I had to offer. Uh, so I sent Chris, Tom, and PJ a very friendly but professional cover letter um, <laughs> and my resume and uh, mentioned that they might know my former boss, Bravi. It's a small, real, the, real, the Rails community was pretty small then. Um, it was like a cover-sized email, decently long, kind of salesy, talked about me and how great I was. So of course it was like a small novella. Um, uh, and two hours later, I got uh, a very classically Chris email back from Chris Wanstroth <laughs> that just said, how about kilowatt in the mission at 8 p.m. on Thursday? <laughs> so meeting up at a bar wasn't weird, but the, the, the terseness of this e one-liner email, especially after my novella, uh, was a little weird. Um, as I eventually learned, this is just how Chris writes most of his emails. Um, and this knowledge came in great handy because I definitely spent about a third of the rest of my career at the company assuring people that Chris was not, in fact, mad at them. <laughs> uh, so Chris, Tom, and I met up at a dive bar in the Mission, and we spent a couple of hours shooting the shit about our backgrounds and life in San Francisco and people we knew in common and things like that. Um, and uh, in that time, I had to manage to uh, keep up with them in a number of drinks, because um, I wanted to be cool, uh, which I did, but barely. <laughs> Uh, during the course of the conversation, we determined that uh, Chris and I actually lived in the same building, uh, and Tom lived in the building directly across the street from that one. Uh, so when it came time to leave, uh, they went outside uh, to hail a cab, um, presumably for all of us since we were going to the same place. Uh, but I had ridden my bicycle. <laughs> and after all of those drinks, I had to figure out what my bicycle looked like and whether or not I still owned the key, <laughs> and then had to get on said bicycle <laughs> and managed to ride it off uh, in front of my prospective employers without falling off, which I did, and they hired me. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, so a few years ago, when I moved back to San Francisco, I did uh, NERT training. Does anyone know what that is? Is anyone here in NERT? Not expected. I expected a couple of people to be in there. Okay. Um, for those of you who not heard of it, NERT is short for Neighborhood Emergency Response Team. Uh, it's a weekend worth of training put on the, by the San Francisco Fire Department uh, that anyone can take that teaches the basics of personal preparedness, hands-on disaster skills, and response team tactics. NERT, NERT's help in large-scale disaster by acting as eyes and ears for the San Francisco Fire Department, feeding detailed information of current conditions block by block, reporting secondary disasters like fires, uh, stuff like that. Um, NERTs uh, also go through a large segment of uh, <laughs> um, medical triage. Medical triage is basically the most depressing thing. Uh, basically, you're separating patients based on severity of injury or illness in light of avail available resources. So in a normal situation, uh, where you have plenty of resources and one victim, uh, you can dedicate a lot of those resources to that one person or that you know couple of people. Uh, in a disaster, you have a shortage of resources and a ton of victims. Uh, so basically, you walk through a room of injured people and you go, well, you've got a scrape, go away. You, your arm is clearly broken and you're probably going to go into shock, but it didn't break the skin and you're not bleeding out, so 
you just wait. We'll we'll get to you eventually. You you have head trauma and are probably going to bleed out and die before we get to you. So you you go to. You. It's really it's awful. Um, it's completely necessary in a large scale disaster where there are a lot of injuries, but it's super dark. So this didn't quite satisfy my desire to like be prepared for anything. Um, I wanted to know how to fix people. So I went to EMT school. I got to do a lot of cool things during EMT school. Uh, I got to do CPR on a dead guy. He came back, not because of my crappy CPR, uh, because of the, the, he came back because of the shot of adrenaline they, they put in his leg. Um, I also got to deliver a baby in the back of an ambulance. Uh, because English is weird, I feel compelled to clarify that it was not my baby that I was delivering. Uh, it was another woman's baby <laughs> I just got to catch. Uh, it was very exciting. <laughs> Uh, I probably would have gone on to paramedic school, um, which is who you really want saving your life if you're ever hurt. Not an EMT. That's like 18 weeks of school. Paramedics are two years. Like, ask if you're conscious. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I started working at GitHub instead, uh, which oddly served uh, a lot of the same needs. There are a lot of different kinds of disasters that can happen. Man-made, like a nuclear attack, that's not outside of the realm of possibility, especially in a city like a San Francisco that's a small-scale target, um, or a very attractive target. Uh, biological warfare, there are a lot of natural disasters like flooding, fire, hurricanes, blizzards, my Colorado friends here. Um, somewhat less likely, but wildly more popular, the zombie apocalypse, alien invasion, killer bees, uh, the way disaster preparedness manifests for someone like me, who grew up in California, and us, who choose to reside in San Francisco, uh, is earthquakes. The U.S. Geological Survey says that earthquakes pose a real danger to more than 75 million Americans in 39 states in the country, in this country alone. So it's not just a Californian problem for those of you watching along at home. Uh, Californians are actually pretty lucky in that we have a relatively recent collective memory of this happening to us and a better prepared infrastructure than most places in the country. So today, together, we are going to experience an earthquake. I obviously cannot reproduce that physically, which would be amazing. I really wish I could. Um, but literally, you and I right now, we're going to experience an earthquake. Picture this. We're sitting in our cool startup office. We are drinking our perfect coffee. We are discussing our next feature launch. And suddenly, this ground starts shaking. A falling beam hits and kills me immediately. I will be the, it's okay, it's okay, I'm fine. You're fine, we're fine, everything's fine. Um, I will be the little creature on your shoulder, oops, sorry, um, helping you make good decisions throughout your day. Uh, when the ground stops shaking, you are miraculously unscathed. Lucky you. Now what? Communication is key. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is pull out your phone. You're gonna be like, uh, I should call 911, presumably to call 911. To call to see if you can get someone to save me, my life, my dead. I'm dead. Um, <laughs> you can't. But you get sidetracked. You're like, oh, Twitter. Oh, I wonder if I wonder if anybody else noticed this earthquake. <laughs> they did. <laughs> I wonder how big it is. It big enough. Uh, and you want to start tweeting and taking pictures. Uh, at this juncture, I want to encourage you not to Instagram anything. Not that you would be able to do that uh, anyway. Um, in fact, you can't even get Twitter to load for some reason. Uh, next, you're going to be like, well, shit. I wonder if my, my boo is OK. My boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, dog walker, whoever you care about, whoever that person is, whoever you look forward to seeing. Um, if this is as serious as you're starting to think it might be, uh, you will want to get in touch with that, with that person. Uh, so you try to call, and it doesn't connect. You go, do you, does, does my phone still work? No. The towers are down. Service is down. This happened in Katrina. This happened a lot, actually. Um, or maybe they're not down. Maybe by some miracle, they're still up. Uh, telecom companies are reporting less damage in recent disasters now and just a complete saturation of the network. Everyone is doing what you're doing with their phone. It's like Outside Lands or Coachella. It's, you, you try over and over again, and this... The network is just saturated. 
Um, texting people uses a lot less bandwidth, so you should try that. Uh, email as well. Um, landlines have a much better chance of working, but can you even find one of those? <laughs> I know there's not one in this building. <laughs> Where? Uh, so no, nothing gets through. Uh, how is communication important in a growing startup? Uh, this might be a no-brainer, uh, but open, honest communication is critical to starting and running a successful business. I believe in open, honest communication. Everyone says that, but I mean it. Stop touching the microphone. Um, probably everyone says that, too. Uh, a lot of people in this room can probably attest to the fact that I will tell you exactly what I think almost all of the time. Uh, I've definitely made enemies this way, uh, but I've also found some of my truest friends and certainly my best colleagues in the same way. Uh, there's one person I know who's more honest, more into honest communication than I, I am, <laughs> and I'm marrying that guy. <laughs> uh, why do I believe in open, honest communication? Uh, first off, I see everything else as a criminal waste of time. Second, it facilitates teamwork and the ability to make things happen in a way that nothing else can. Uh, can you go without? You can try, but in most endeavors, you are regaled to su successfully working with the number of people you can clearly communicate with. Uh, so if you can't communicate well with others, probably that means you'll be stuck to small scale change, small projects, small creations. If you can't communicate your ideas to others, no one can help you realize your dream. Aww. I'm not much of a TV person, but we started watching West Wing recently and it's amazing. It's an example of great teamwork and a group of people who truly trust each other. Think about Josh Lyman on West Wing. He can be blunt, sure, tactless, occasionally. <laughs> but was, was his brand of candid honesty integral to the running of possibly the best fictional government our nation will ever see? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Sometimes I get mad because I don't think they have enough interpersonal issues. I'm like, they're always working together to solve external problems instead of getting lost in petty infighting. It's a suspiciously ideal set of humans, Sorkin. <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> GitHub has embraced my love of open lines of communication and has one zillion ways to communicate. Uh, we have a ton of topic-specific chat rooms, uh, github.com itself, pull requests, discussions, issues, internal apps, including a Twitter-style status, status posting uh, app called Team, as well as a longer form forum called Ideas. Of course, we do traditional email, IM, texts, and emoji. Never forget the emoji and the gifts. Uh, another way I think strong communication is key is uh, feedback. No one exists in a void, certainly no one exists well in a void. Years ago, I spent a lot of time going, well, I've clearly thought out every possible uh, outcome of this. Um, but I learned that as soon as you say something out loud to, to other people, they kind of go, oh, what about this? And you're like, I had I thought I thought of everything. I didn't think of that. Running past your ideas past people is incredibly refreshing. The power of an egoless, genuine exchange from someone who hasn't been locked down in the nitty gritty of a problem and can come at it with a new set of eyes is really unparalleled. They can see the holes in your process and speak to those where you've been in it for so long that you can no longer see the forest for the trees, as they say. Uh, it works best when it's a two-way street and both parties want the other to be better. Maybe the feedback you get includes something you don't agree with. Then you spend a few minutes going, did I forget to explain a fundamental key piece of this? Is there a reason? Uh, maybe that one piece changes everything and you forgot to mention it. Ask questions. Have a conversation. Uh, and sometimes you're wrong. It's OK to be wrong. There are three sides to just in case you're not reading the slide. There are three slides to every story, yours, mine, and the truth. Uh, so, okay, back to our disaster scenario. Uh, I am dead. You are alive and you're fine. Uh, you can't get a hold of your person. Uh, you can't get to Twitter. Uh, so you head out of the building and you walk out onto the street. You get in your car, but you're seeing crazier than usual potholes uh, in the road and traffic is already starting to get pretty crazy from everyone else jumping in their cars and trying to get home. So you're like, well, maybe I'll take the bus. But you see a bus there and it's been abandoned by the bus driver. He is pieced right out. That's cool, you'll just Uber. <laughs> you decide to walk. 
you're strolling down Townsend here, and you get past the McDonald's. And as you walk past, you smell gas, like gas, not like French fry gas, but gasoline. And you wonder, is that bad? That's probably bad. Something's probably broken. But you don't know how to turn it off. You're a smart person. You know how to turn your gas off at home. You have the fancy wrench. You know how to do it. But this is McDonald's. Who cares about McDonald's? So you walk past McDonald's, uh, and about a block further down, you hear an explosion. And you turn around to see that that McDonald's is now a blazing ball of fire. Luckily, you missed it. People are starting to emerge from office buildings, dusty, a little bit dazed, not really knowing what to do. It's slowly starting to dawn on you that this is the big one. Uh, now let's pause for a second and go into omniscient mode. The things you don't know yet. Infrastructure has collapsed beyond what you can imagine. Major utility, utility systems have buckled. The water is out. The power is out. It's daylight and you're outside, so you haven't really noticed. But at some point, you're going to wonder how to charge your cell phone. Since water is out, sewer is out. We're not going to talk about that one. <laughs> Natural gas is out. Or it's not out, which may pose a, a bigger problem. Public transit is gone. The roads are in pieces. The bridges are definitely out. The BART tunnel is collapsed and flooded. Uh, if you don't worry about this every time you BART through that tunnel, now you will. <laughs> You're welcome. Some buildings have toppled. There is an estimated six feet of glass piled in the streets of some parts of the Fidei from all of the shattering glass in the high-rises. You could say we have problems. Uh, to contextualize this, I'm actually going to show you some footage of 1989, uh, of the 89 earthquake. I think it starts out pretty funny. Uh, it gets serious pretty fast. Okay, this is interesting. Oh. Is there, I didn't warn. Should I? Oops. <gasps> I don't think I warned the video guys that I was going to be playing video. How does that get? Can anybody, I guess that this sound doesn't actually matter at all. Pretty good. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the, some of the bridge footage before. That's, that's pretty iconic. Um, I remember that earthquake. Oops. Uh, uh, my mother always swore that she had a sixth sense. She could hear earthquakes coming before they happened. And I, I don't know if that's true. But what I remember is before I realized that that earthquake was happening, I lived, I lived in San Jose at the time, um, she had my younger brother and I by our arms, and we were like flying through the air to underneath the dining room table um, before I realized there was an earthquake. So there might be something, something to that. Oh, no, we don't want to watch that again. So humans are your biggest problem. So the thing, the next thing that uh, startups and disasters have in common. <laughs> Uh, oh, I see. Um, so you have to provide for them. Luckily, that's not your job. Um, but you have to take care of yourself. Uh, that is your job. And no one else is going to do it for you. Ostensibly, there's a government organization that's in charge of this. You should do it yourself. Uh, <laughs> looting is also a big problem. Um, after every major modern disaster, uh, there's a period of looting. Uh, you could say that human beings are opportunistic jerks, which sometimes they are, but really they probably just need stuff. Um, after a day or two of initial chaos, a disaster becomes a military state. Uh, this happened in the 1906 earthquake. This happened at Katrina. This, this is how you, <laughs> you reinstate order. Uh, martial law is declared. The military rolls in. If you haven't been hurt by the actual incident, there's a great likelihood that you get shot for looting. <laughs> it's not funny, sorry. Um, uh, 
<laughs> this, this tweet is, is amazing. I mean, it's so, it's so true. Um, humans are your biggest problem. In a disaster, you have to take care of a lot of humans who are unprepared to take care of themselves. Uh, a few days ago, I did a dry run of this talk. Uh, so that's true of startups as well, um, in a role like mine. Uh, a few days ago, I did a dry run of this talk, and the person I was doing it for asked me, so why are humans your biggest problem? And I was like, how are they not? <laughs> Basically, you name it, and it has been mucked up by humans in some shape or form. Uh, but then what I realized, what I meant, is that humans are your busy, biggest logistical problem. Uh, they're messy, literally and emotionally. Never let anyone tell you that nerds don't have feelings. Uh, they are like insanely needy. They need to be fed, they need to be watered, they need their paychecks consistently and on time. <laughs> they need health insurance in case they get sick. They need a cool office to come to every day. They need their specifically flavored soda in a specifically shaped vessel. <laughs> true, true story. Uh, GitHub's first sales guy and I went through like this year-long battle over ordering Diet Coke in cans versus bottles. <laughs> Uh, this is all fine, of course, because this is job security for me. <laughs> um, humans at scale are your biggest problem. Uh, when I was planning CodeConf, I was like, wow, I cannot do all this by myself. I need a lot of help in the days leading up to the conference, as well as the day of, and it was going to get prohibitively expensive to hire this out. We needed people to assemble name tags, swag bags, do pre-registration, man day of registration, do the shop booth, uh, answer questions, direct people where to go. Uh, so I stole what I thought of at the time as the San Francisco Bicycle Coalition model and offered free entry to the conference for anyone who volunteered a four hour chunk of their time. Uh, since it was a pretty sweet deal and pretty great hourly rate, uh, I gave students, interns, and other non-highly compensated individuals priority. I got a great response and ended up having all the help that I needed uh, without having to tap it into uh, existing GitHub employees for their time. Uh, the icing on the cake of that experiment was that almost all of my volunteers were awesome people and wonderful to work with. And in fact, two of my favorite volunteers now work at GitHub. Uh, any growing company needs, gets the eternal question of uh, what, would, what would the company look like in X months or X years? In the early days, this question used to make us groan. We would get it from banks and financial people. We would get it from real estate agents. It's a completely valid question, especially if you need to do capacity planning for things like an office. But we didn't have a CFO until about a year ago. So there was no one creating budgets or modeling on our growth. Uh, we were always just like, we don't know how big we're going to be in a year. Like, we're busy. We're like doing things. We're making things happen. Like, <laughs> ever, all we know is things are going really well, and they're going to keep going really well. And no, we have no idea how many square foot of, feet of office space we need. No idea. Um, humans are tricky. Uh, the problem, of course, with humans being your biggest problem is that they are also your greatest asset. Um, in fact, they're all that they're all that really matters, and I mean that in the most like esoteric, touchy feely, like let's all hug it out, kumbaya way. Um, <laughs> next, uh, you have to be prepared for anything, both at a startup and in our disaster. Um, which you are wandering around the streets of San Francisco right now, I will remind you. Uh, I was a Girl Scout, which probably explains the last 20 minutes of your life. Suck it. The Girl Scout motto is be prepared. Um, so uh, let's zoom back into your physical body from omniscient mode. Um, uh, let's say you live in a mission. You're entering the mission, and you're rounding the quarter on your meeting spot. You're a very smart person. You have set up a predetermined meeting spot with your significant other. You said, OK, well, if we can't call each other, if there's no electronic means of communication, we'll meet at X street corner as soon as we can. You've done this ahead of time. You're going to go home and do this. Make sure it's not Dolores Park, because everyone has beat you to that. But pick a spot. You have to pick a one spot. Um, so you're rounding the corner on the spot that you have uh, predetermined. Uh, there waiting for you is a very relieved lover, roommate, BFF, dog walker, don't care. Um, together, you walk back to your house, still absorbing all the damage that you see. Uh, entire buildings are gone. Broken fire hydrants are spraying water, although you notice with some alarm that the water pressure has been diminishing rapidly on your walk. Uh, people are still milling around, some of them pretty obviously hurt. 
You get to the block that your building is on, nervous about what you'll see. Miraculously, it's intact. Uh, so what do you have in your house? Some of you are starting to tune out, but let me just bring it home to you. This is seven gallons of water. Uh, the American Red Cross recommends one gallon of water per person per day for five days. Uh, it used to be three days, but after Katrina, uh, they hadn't gotten to people in, they hadn't gotten to everyone in three days. Um, so now it's five. Uh, this is two extra gallons, so you can have a pet, or maybe a shower, or save half of another person. Um, this is, uh, I think I took a little out of this, actually. This is backpacking food. You need food in your house. Um, this is 13 servings, or 13 meals, uh, so a little over three days. Uh, these are single servings of the same. Um, you can do cans. It doesn't matter. I don't care. I do backpacking food because this shit's delicious. Like, I look forward to this. Um, and all you need is water. And you don't even need heat, really. I don't know. Um, and a radio. Uh, ostensibly, um, the... Uh, we'll get there. It's fine. <laughs> ah, in theory, San Francisco's emergency outdoor warning system, that thing that goes off every Tuesday, it should work, and it should be broadcasting information. Uh, it is solar-powered. Um, but if it doesn't, you should really have a radio. And this is the one, guys. It's the one recommended by the American Red Cross. Uh, and it, so it's hand crank. It's solar-powered. Uh, and it also has a USB charger, so you can still charge your useless phone. Isn't that cool? Get that. Uh, so in addition to having a predetermined meeting spot, you have enough water for everyone in your house for five days. Again, one gallon per person per day for five days. Um, uh, you have food for as long as you want, um, at, least, at least five days. Uh, and you have a radio. Uh, still not, no, no one's coming for you. <laughs> a lot of earthquake preparedness kits have things like band-aids in them, which is a huge pet peeve of mine. <laughs> if you need a band-aid, you don't have problems. <laughs> uh, you could argue something about infection, but how often have you gotten an infection from like a tiny cut that you needed a band-aid for? You haven't. Um, I could probably give another full-length talk on what I actually think should go into a medical kit. Um, we're going to skip that. Uh, most, most people say also have things like flashlights, space blankets, ways to entertain the kitties. Um, those are all pretty secondary. This is, this, is what, this is almost all you need, sort of. Um, extreme weather is not usually a big thing in San Francisco. I know that feels false after the last couple of weeks. Uh, uh, but you might have to put on a sweater. Sorry. Uh, at this point in my... <laughs> oh, you can't. <laughs> um, neither can I. It's fine. Uh, at this point, because I do this song and dance for all my friends, in fact, I regularly buy these for people as gifts. It's not a good gift. Um, people usually say, oh, well, I'll be fine. <laughs> it's fine. I'll just come to your house. <laughs> And I'm like, do not come to my house. I have enough of this for me and my family. I will bludgeon you to death with my now useless laptop, <laughs> no matter how much I love you. Um, you can come to my house, but it's, it's BYO survival. Bring, bring your water. Those are heavy. But come, come over. Um, the need to be prepared for anything uh, is how org, org was born. Uh, who here is Orgorg? Yeah, 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 okay. Uh, org, org is short for organization organizers, uh, or the people in charge of keeping the lights on uh, at startups, tech companies. Uh, it's a group of non-technical people working in tech companies uh, and small companies around the world. Oh, yeah. Uh, we leave it fairly broad, uh, but essentially the focus is internal facing support people at a company. Uh, business operations, office managers, HR people, facilities, EA, concierge, uh, anything who keeps the wheels, anyone who keeps the wheels turning, and the humans problem shaped, human shaped problems happy. Uh, I call it internal facing support because if you think about it, basically every time you go and ask your office manager or operations person for 
a new gadget or uh, a better chair or a different kind of lunch, you're more or less filing a support request. And they pile up fast. Uh, if you've ever worked in support, uh, take a minute to think about how stressful it can be when someone wants something from you. And now think about how stressful it would be when you got regularly conflicting things <laughs> uh, requested. Um, and think about uh, for each one of those that you either don't or can't satisfy, um, think of them as someone who's going to glare at you for the next week. Or worse, <laughs> hold it against you forever. <laughs> or worse, go into anaphylactic shock because you accidentally fed them peanuts. That's never happened. As far as Not on my watch. <laughs> uh, we created org, org out of a need. Uh, Sharon Schmidt from Heroku, uh, Heroku's me, their first non-technical person, and I would get together for coffee fairly regularly, and we would often compare growth notes or ask how the other person was handling a particular situation. And we got to talking about how nice it would be to have a group of people who did what we did that we could talk to. The idea was to have this group of people get together periodically and either discuss a problem or have someone who had been in an operations role for a long time come in and talk to the group about a specific thing. Shortly thereafter, I met Kim Rohr of Discuss, who at the time was our downstairs neighbor. Uh, she was in a similar role as Sharon and I. She was the only person in a non-technical role at a tech company. Uh, and she came upstairs to ask a question about the building. We got to talking about this concept of a group. Uh, and Kim, always the doer, started one. Uh, we began as about seven people. We had a lovely picnic lunch in Yerba Buena Gardens one sunny day. Uh, that was almost exactly uh, three years ago and 480 members ago. Uh, that represents over 200 companies. Uh, in practice, the way the group has manifested is more of a brain trust. Uh, someone sends out a message and is like, hey, I have this problem. I need a good real estate agent. I need a last minute caterer. What do you, I'm looking for good HR software. What do you recommend? Um, I basically would have killed for this resource six or seven years ago at the beginning of my career. The group gets really fascinating occasionally when the conversation turns to behaviors. Why do I have to clean up after them? Doing the dishes was not on my job description. Does anyone ever feel like they are part of a not so subtle class, second class? Um, we're not here to discuss those questions today. That's a totally different talk. Um, but they are my favorite and one of the things I enjoy the most about the group. Uh, and yet, no matter how prepared you think you are, how many resources you have at your disposal, monetary or otherwise, how sure you th are that you have thought of everything at a startup or in a disaster, <laughs> something is always on fire. <laughs> Uh, now, in our earthquake scenario, uh, you have turned to the corner, you are at your home, you have all of your supplies. Nothing has gone wrong for you. Not so much with me. Uh, but you are home, you are safe, you are fed, you are watered. You have the next couple of days and you are fine. You're going to be fine. Uh, there are a million things that could have gone wrong during your journey. Uh, your day could have been complicated right off the bat by a broken leg or a mild concussion at the initial onset of the earthquake. You could have been trapped in the building. You could have been, you could have walked past the McDonald's two minutes later than you did and been consumed in a fiery ball of French fry grease. Uh, your partner might have never shown up at your meeting spot. Uh, maybe you get back to your home or apartment and it's been flattened, uh, taking all of your wonderful disaster preparedness with it. Uh, maybe your home literally catches on fire moments before you get there. Uh, but none of these things happened. You're so lucky. Uh, anyone know who this guy is or where he is? He's in one of these. So you see these around the city a lot. It's a cistern. I'm so proud of you. Um, there are uh, over 100, I think there are 116 um, uh, of these. They're full of water. They were put in place in the city in 1908 after the 06 earthquake. Uh, and they are full of water uh, so that if our, fire, or if our uh, water supply gets cut off, the firefighters still have water to fight fires with. Huh. That's a bad day. I feel like I've had days, like work days like that. Um, in fact, as a, at a startup, everything always sort of feels like that. Um, something is always on fire. Uh, if you're the only non-technical ops person in the room, this makes things both easier and harder. Uh, easier because you could tell at a glance if it's your fire or not. Oh, the side is down? Can't really do anything about that. 
oh, a pile of ravenous code monkeys who have been debugging the site for hours? I can fix that one. Uh, harder because a lot of the time you are the only person fighting your fires. Uh, I was the only non-technical person at GitHub for two years. It's kind of a lonely place to be. Uh, and even when you start growing the general and administrative branch of a company, mm -hmm. there's often only one biz ops person, office manager, executive assistant, whoever it is. And you kind of go, wow, it's really lonely over here buried in this pile of due diligence paperwork. I wish I had something to dig me out. When something is always on fire, you have to remember to triage on every level. Uh, everything is always wrong, and to avoid going crazy, you can't focus on the sheer number of things you have to do. Uh, what's the most important? Focus on that first. Uh, you have to have a person, or more likely a group of people, at the top level doing this for the company. Then you need one for products, you need one for teams, and of course you need to always be your own. Uh, nothing gets done if you're spending all of your time worrying about the fact that nothing is ever getting done. Uh, the other key is finding a group of people that you can trust. Delegate things to them and trust them. If they fail, was that you? Did you do that? Uh, did you fail either in your assessment of their abilities or more likely the way in which you communicated your needs to them? Um, how many people do you think you can manage at once? That number probably varies from person to person, but it is almost assuredly far less than you think it is. Every person over the number of people that you can successfully devote the needed amount of time to is another person that you are failing and another weak point in your organization. All right, uh, recap. This is all, please, please. Backpacking food. All of this you can buy on Amazon, by the way. Okay, so you can walk into, you can walk into your sports basement and buy one of these, any camping goods store, you can buy one of these. Um, they will probably go, you're going to Burning Man? And you'll be like, no, I'm not going to Burning Man. Um, you can also order these on Amazon. They're like 17 bucks, they're super cheap. Go, one for every person in your house. Food, radio. That's all, just start there. Um, I, liked, I would like to think that some of the things that I've said have gotten you thinking. Um, the advice in this talk is very service, for surface novelty. There are a thousand other things that you can do to prepare for an earthquake. I encourage you to look into them. Um, I omitted a ton, glossed over things, trivialized. Um, if you are serious about pre being prepared, uh, educate yourself further. Um, I can tweet out like a gist of these links later or something. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. That's it. Thanks, guys. I've been torturing Melissa all week. She's been texting me, what are the questions? Tell me the questions. I haven't answered. I've just played dead, you know? Now you have to tell me. Yeah, now, unfortunately. But you're, in my, you're on my house now. OK, so everyone at GitHub has a Melissa story. Because she was the first employee here, everyone has one. So my Melissa story, which is good. Don't be, this is, this is, not what we do in our private time. This it is wasn't a in GitHub Africa, story. Was it? Um, so, when I was interviewing at GitHub, I was really concerned with um, the fact that there weren't any technical women on the product teams. And so, um, a big thing that I look for in companies I want to work with is to I want to make sure that it's a good environment for women to be in, and one that they're not afraid of. So, um, I was interviewing at also a bar. If you've noticed a pattern here. <laughs> <laughs> and we walk in and Chris, the, the founder, and Melissa are sitting there having their one-on-one. -on -one. And Melissa just does this thing with me where she just looks me, you know, turns, me, turns to me square. Are you going to cry? Don't cry. Don't cry. Um, and she goes, hi, I'm Melissa. It's so great to meet you. I can't wait to work with you. I don't know if those are your exact words, but that's what I felt like. Probably. You said that with your eyes, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But it was like one of those moments for me where I was like, wow, okay, this woman wants to work with more women. That's such a rare thing in tech. People are very concerned with being the only woman in tech most of the time. More women. Yeah, more women. So um, that was a great sign, and that was actually one of the reasons that I joined GitHub. And I think a lot of people have these Melissa stories. Um, and I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is you have this special skill that you want to admit to most of the time um, for making I'm people- i not tell anyone about my special skill. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad this is the last one of the year. Getting really tired of all this innuendo. 
Um, <laughs> so you have this special skill um, of making people feel like they're a part of the team. Um, and many people here have admitted to it, it's not just me, admitted to it, like we're held at gunpoint or something. <laughs> one, of other, one, one other of Melissa's special skills. Also a skill. <laughs> Where do you think that that part of you comes from? Is it something you inherited from your parents? Is it life experience? Is it genetic? Are you ready? For, oh, God, you're nervous. I'm that ready. Answer. Strangers are just friends you haven't met yet. <laughs> no, but it's true. <laughs> think about the number of people that you know now, the people you are actually friends with now, that you were close to, who you would call in an emergency, um, how many of those people did you know five years ago or 10 years ago? Uh, I, think, I think there are wonderful people everywhere. There are absolutely people <laughs> who are exceptions to that case. Do not make no mistake. Um, <laughs> but most people are uh, truly genu genuinely good, uh, well-intentioned, uh, and I mean, especially in a, in a vulnerable situation, like an interview, God, that's terrifying. Like, why would you not take every opportunity to be like, come, come here, like, just, it's okay. We've all been there. That sucks. So you're saying this is something that can be learned. I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Trust too many people, maybe. Um, so is, it, is that a skill that you think people can learn, that people can uh, learn to communicate better and be those types oh, of people? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> I was reading something really cheesy recently uh, that I cannot quote properly. Um, but it was about finding something that you liked in people that you weren't even that fond of and, and s speaking to that piece uh, in particular because uh, there is something like that in, in every person. Most people. <laughs> Asterix, <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you hire for that in a team? Ooh. Oh, that's a... Got to talk into the mic. That's a great question. Uh, I mean, some people it's immediately obvious. Uh, when you're talking about people in uh, technical companies in a technical capacity uh, who are an overwhelming majority natural introverts, uh, that gets significantly harder. Um, I don't know if I have an answer for that. That's a great question. I'm take them to a bar, that. make them ride a bike. Don't, you don't need to take, I mean, I mean, alcohol is obviously a vehicle for loosening people up and getting them to talk or relax or be more themselves, but it's not, don't take them to a bar. Cool. Are there specific roles at a company that you think uh, people with that special skill, like making people feel like they're a part of the team, where do you think those people mostly lie in a company? Are they mostly in operational roles or? Uh, I think every team could benefit uh, from someone like that. Uh, I think a lot of natural introverts really, you know, have a chance to, to thrive when they have someone that they feel comfortable enough with who can also kind of translate like their awkwardness into something that like makes a little more sense. Um, m most of those roles are operational, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of our GitHub's onboarding people are very warm people, uh, very welcoming, and I think that's a big piece, you know, in that, in that first week at a new company with this enormous learning curve where you're terrified and every face is a new face, like having someone who looks familiar and feels familiar and kind uh, is really powerful. What do you think was the hardest part of being the first woman at a startup? <laughs> if you just want to eye roll, that's okay. <laughs> Hard questions, I know. I only do it because I love you. Do you want a list? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> the first year that I worked for the company, uh, we didn't have an office at all. Uh, we worked from, I worked from my pajamas. I don't know if anybody else got dressed. Um, but there was no office. Uh, I probably saw the other couple of employees, you know, a couple times a month at the most. Uh, the next year that we had an office, we had an office with one bathroom. <laughs> Never share one bathroom with eight men, ever. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then, I mean, as I mentioned, so Beth was the first person who came and joined the company, and it's so funny, uh, she just talked. Like, I wasn't used to, she would like tell me about like 
her friends and her family and what was going on in her life. And I would always look at her and be like, I, A, I'm busy. I like you. Why are you talking? Oh, this is what girls do. We talk. I was like, so we're used to working with guys. And I was like, we just never, like, if we were talking to each other, we were saying a set of things that, like, I just did not understand at all. Uh, and it was really nice to have a human again. That's great. So um, for those of you who don't know, Melissa is <laughs> humans. Men are not human. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> That's not what I mean. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't know, Melissa is responsible for um, a lot, a big part of like the strong, um, I don't want to say female, but like ladies of GitHub culture here. And it's something that, you know, made me feel really comfortable and a lot of the other women who work here, you know, and, and it was definitely a culture of, or it is a culture of women who support each other and don't tear each other down. Um, and I, this was the first place that I've ever been where that's been the case. And how, like, how important, like, how important is it to build that strong, like, female culture early? And how do you do it? The most important? <laughs> is there anything more important? Um, uh, and by the way, I mean, passion projects came out of this, right? Like, yeah. I felt empowered to do something like that at a company of mostly men. And I feel like that's not normally the case, so. There is a Tina Fey quote. I don't know if you're familiar with Tina Fey, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Tina Fey is Julie's favorite. Uh, something along the lines of uh, uh, you're not competing you know a lot of women feel like you're competing with the other women in the room you say it Can I'll you correct you it? Yeah. okay thank you okay so I think it's uh, a lot of women feel like they're competing with other women for things uh, where you're actually competing with uh, everyone and that's absolutely true and in fact uh, I mean I think other women are your, your actually, you're actually your biggest allies you have so much more in common can I say it? Oh, no, I'm not going to say that. Never mind. Um. <laughs> you got it pretty close. Pretty close. I oh, think, so, so the good part about it is, especially when it, with regard to men, it's men will try to trick you or they will try, I don't know who they is, uh. they will try to trick you into thinking you're competing with other women. Um, you know, if Barbara's up for a promotion, they'll go, it will be between me and Barbara. Um, when that's not true, you're competing right. with everyone in the room. That suggests, that suggests a world where... Uh, the woman is still a novelty and she's like a one-off and there aren't going to be any more. So you are in competition with each other, which kind of did happen in what, like the fifties when women started participating in business really. Uh, and that's, it's just flat out not the case anymore. Uh, I'm looking around this room. There's more than 50% women and that's awesome. Like more, please more, especially in tech, especially like with, I mean, we're in such a minority right now. Like it's every single woman that joined GitHub. I was like, please, like come here, like welcome. I'm so happy to see you. Like, can you, don't go, <laughs> don't go anywhere. Please, please don't leave. Yeah. Let's be friends. <laughs> says says the woman who left me last month. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Jerk. Um, so, what do you think? Being here so early, uh, one of our past speakers, Leslie Bradshaw, had something really smart to say about. Um, you know, what the one thing, if she could go back uh, when she was starting a company, the one thing that she would get right the first time, and it was, she was like, hire a CPA. Like, hire an accountant immediately. Like, don't, don't, you know, because we have dads. And that's an important thing. Plus one. What do you, what do you think is the one thing that you would have done differently, or that, the one thing you have to do when you start a company? Those are two different questions. Answer both. <laughs> uh... uh I did not have, I agree with Leslie Bradshaw wholeheartedly. Um, bookkeeping is the worst thing. Where's Saloni? Where's Allison? Hi, guys. Uh, the worst thing. <laughs> uh, uh, but GitHub actually outsourced that. So I actually never had to do, I, I had to do that for the, the last company I worked for. And it's uh, not fun, and I'm not that good at it. Um, so luckily, when I joined GitHub, the guys uh, in that first interview, they were like, hey, so we actually have a bookkeeper, uh, is that cool? And I was like, oh yeah, that's great, that's great. Um, so I never had to do any of that for, uh, for GitHub, uh, which is great, so full agreement on that. Um, what did, what, what do I, what do I, have I done better? Yeah. <clears throat> Use more exclamation points? I went through this long phase where I was like, do everything like a man. Uh, which included sending emails that weren't, they were clear, they were concise, they, uh, 
they had a maximum of one exclamation point, but basically never had an exclamation point, and certainly no happy faces. And I think that might have, I mean, contrary to all the kind things that Julie has just said about uh, making women at GitHub feel welcome, I kind of worry that that alienated a couple of people when I was just like sending these emails that were just like, that's it. I don't know, that sounds like really trite. I'm sorry. <laughs> just like your emails, great. Okay. <laughs> This is, we have fun. <laughs> this is fun. Okay, so if you could do it all over again, how do you, what do you, you already did a fantastic job of building a strong female culture here, but what would you do to make sure that this was a great environment for women to work in? Or if you're starting your, and your new company, what do you do first? To, specifically towards, like, for, to build a good environment for women. Are you playing it's not perfect? <laughs> Do you read my Twitter stream? I mean, of course it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect. Um, so, perfect no, I mean, I mean, like, what can we do in the industry, though? I mean, everyone here works at a startup, right? Who doesn't work at a startup? Okay, may, okay, forget, you guys can leave now. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Please stay. You don't Please stay. Um, I think, wh what did you do? Like, what, what can we do to make it a better tech, a better place for a woman to be, other than have two bathrooms? And toilet paper, buy toilet paper, you guys. <laughs> buy toilet paper. <clears throat> it's obvious a problem. Uh, I mean, I think I would prefer to have more technical women, and it's just flat out difficult to find them. I found them. What are you talking about? Julie found them. I found them. Found them. They're hiding somewhere. She found them. <laughs> Bring them here. Yeah, I tried. Where, where are they hiding? Is there like a room full of... Is that where the internet comes from? Trap them. That's why you're all really here. <laughs> Trap them here. No. Um, yeah, that's obviously a good... I mean, I think also having an early technical female employee will help. That would be really... That would be amazing. Would be really awesome. Yes, please. Moving on. Yeah. Uh, being more... I mean, right now we're at a point where we need to be more conscious about it and uh, probably a little more nurturing. You know the... Oh, God, the talk I was going to give. Is my laptop still up here? You don't get to give another talk. I, it was like a one-minute talk, which is why it was not the talk. It was explaining nerds to nerds. Nerds to nerds. It was an amazing talk. It was one minute. <laughs> um, what are you giving now? I can, can I get my slides back? <laughs> no, don't give them to her. Left. We have sorry, 27 I'll, seconds. I'll give it later. Okay, I have one more question. I have one more question, and then maybe we'll try to take some from the audience. Um, what's next for Melissa? What's the next step? That's a great question. Um, I have a sweater that I've been knitting <laughs> for possibly longer than GitHub has existed. I'm gonna finish that fucker. Um, I'm reading a lot of good books. <laughs> and then? Uh, I might, so I might plan uh, a couple of conferences next year. Um, I will eventually start looking for a next uh, little baby GitHub to uh, nurture, to deliver in the back of an ambulance, uh, and then nurture into a uh, full capacity. She's full talking about companies, not men, by the 230 way. 230-person <laughs> company. And get oh, tough. Um, so I am looking, what? what? I'm just what? making jokes to myself. <laughs> this is more fun for me than for her. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> okay. Um, and then? Yeah, we'll look for next time. Maybe I'll go to paramedic school, but I'm terrible. Oh, maybe business school. Should I go to business school? No. <laughs> Taylor, you're the first employee of GitHub. Why? You don't have to ever go to school again. Think about the piece of paper. Like, everyone will listen I'll to I'll make you that. one. <laughs> I'll draw you one with crayons. Come on. Okay. Done. Yes. I think Melissa should be um, one of your startup COOs. So... She's looking, hire her in a year or so, I'm but her vacation. I'm looking that hard. Can you call me in three months? Three months is good. She's done with that sweater. <laughs> I have to finish the sweater. Just kidding, that's generous. Um, so does the audience have any questions now that I'm done beating Melissa up? <laughs> yeah, Laura. Laura. What's your background? Uh, school would have come in handy now. I didn't go to school, which is why I'm still trying to figure out the business uh, degree thing. Um, I am from the Bay Area originally. 
I spent eight years in Portland, Oregon. I've been back in San Francisco for five. Um, before GitHub, I did basically the same thing at another, uh, it was a Ruby on Rails consultancy um, up in Portland. Before that, I did medical admin for the craziest surgeons I've ever, like crazy, crazy doctor people. Don't, go, don't do that. Um, what else? Anything else? Anything specific? I like knitting. I would knit if I had time to knit. Uh, I like going on long bike rides. <laughs> I'm not, that, I'm actually really boring. I'm sorry. Say again. Yeah, do you want to, I like long walks on the beach. <laughs> Call me. Don't, oh, Julie's mad now. Wow. Not in front of Kevin. That's so mean. Okay. Sorry, um, <laughs> do we have any other questions? Yes. Yes, you are about Rachel. Hi. I love you. Rachel's question is, in the event of a disaster, when the sewer system is out, what do you do? And she's asking this because I chose not to go into this uh, during the dry run of my talk a couple of days ago. Um, I will now go into it, Rachel. Uh, because everything is out, uh, your toilet no longer flushes, like really everything. We could, I could spend a whole nother hour talking about how sh awful everything actually is gonna be. <laughs> Shitty, ha, ha, ha. Um, uh, so uh, the sewer system doesn't work, the water doesn't work, um, your toilet no longer flushes. Um, uh, biohazard is a, is a real problem in, in <laughs> disasters like this. Uh, so you're gonna poop in a bag. Like, you're gonna poop in a bag. You're gonna get an industrial. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you're gonna, in a, in a perfect world, you can actually, again, while you're, while you're ordering your water canister on Amazon, you can actually also buy a five gallon bucket. Um, it's serious. What's, what's, more, what's worse than pooping in a bucket is uh, the biohazard that would ensue if you just decided to poop in the, in the gutters. I'm so good. Thanks, to, th everyone thank Rachel. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, I think I have time for like one more question. Can Does please not end on that question. Yeah. Anybody ask anything? Hi, is that Justine? Yeah. Hey. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so my question is, um, Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, I sort of deliberately avoided the women in tech thing in my talk, um, just because I think there are a lot more people who can speak to that much more intelligently than I can. Um, I do have firsthand experience, but I haven't. Uh, <coughs> it's something I like to avoid. Um, but that's a great question, and especially that divide is a really great, que great question. Um, I remember going back to Rachel over there Poop question, Rachel. <laughs> um, I remember a time where I, we had a conversation and she was like, wow, you like, it's funny because you wear skirts and dresses and I feel like that's exactly what I kind of can't or shouldn't do because that sort of sets a pre you know, she's she's technical, she's a developer. Um, and she's like, I feel like I shouldn't do that set of things because it kind of sets me apart uh, as a person who cares Right, like you're suddenly like, oh, like you have a different set of priorities or whatever, and you're just like, what? rock. <clears throat> the answer, short answer is rock whatever it is that does it for you. Absolutely, I, own, own it and just like own your otherness completely. Like I felt yes. really similarly to you, Justine, um, coming into tech, especially when, yeah, like like guys especially will like point out like even early in my career when I wore lipstick or anything like that. Um, I think I tried really hard to play down um, my femininity for like the first uh, couple years I was in tech. Now that I've paid my dues, I don't give a fuck who knows I'm a girl. Um, yeah, 
I actually think it's more powerful when you can wear lipstick and write better code than someone. <laughs> and on, on that note, I have a very special um, surprise for Melissa. She's just mad at me because last time it was her birthday and I... <laughs> Jake Boxer popped out of a case. So, so this is pretty symbolic for, for GitHub and for us in general. Um, but just, we want to say thank you, but I want to, our very first female intern is here to give you your thank you gift for doing passion projects. So it's pretty symbolic for us, the first female employee and the first female intern. <laughs> Melissa has helped pave the way for both Manisha, our first intern, and myself. And, um, I don't think I can express the right kind of gratitude without crying up here, and I won't do that to you because we got more booze to drink and more food to eat. Um, so thank you all for being here, and thank you most of all, Melissa, for everything you've done for this company. I would company. like to thank the Academy. <laughs> My mother. Can we give her a huge round of applause? <laughs>